Hello, Mrs H here. Organising things involves categorising them based on similarities, whether it be subjects at school, books in the library, food in the supermarket, it makes things easier to find. Organisms have also been placed into categories based on their similarities, and this is called classification. Carl Linnaeus was around in the 1700s and suggested a way of categorising and naming organisms. The categories are called taxonomic groups and are placed in a hierarchy. Organisms are sorted into the first taxonomic group, which is called a kingdom, and there are five different kingdoms. Each kingdom is divided into smaller taxonomic groups, starting with phylum, and then each of these are further divided into different classes, then orders, families, genuses, and species. You need to remember the order of these taxonomic groups and there are different ways to help you. You could take the first letter of each word and use a rhyme like King Paul came over for green salad. My favourite way of remembering the order of the taxonomic groups is to watch this terribly cheesy 1980s classification rap. Just search for it in YouTube. Yes, it is dated, it's cheesy, it's a bit cringy, but it's classic 1980s and it really helps my students to remember the order. Once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. Let's look at the human classification. You can see we belong to the animal kingdom, Animalia. We can now easily fill in the other taxonomic groups, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. You don't have to remember the names of chordata, mammalia, primates, etc. But you do need to know the order of the taxonomic groups on the left. Organisms will belong to one of the five kingdoms of life. They could belong to the kingdom fungi, prokaryote, protoctista, plantae or animalia. Here we have classifications for the cat, the wolf and the African elephant. If you look at their Latin names in the green boxes and the genus and species name above, you can see that they are given two part names. The first name is the genus and the second name is the species, a bit like a first name and a surname. Notice the genus part of the name starts with a capital letter, but the species part of the name always starts with a lowercase letter. All the names are in Latin, so that is a universal Latin language that the scientists in this community will use to talk about the different animals or organisms that they're speaking about. So, for example, cat, wolf and elephant would be called different names in different languages. But if all the scientists use the correct Latin names, then everybody knows which organism they are talking about. These two part names are examples of the binomial naming system that Linnaeus came up with. In an exam, you might see a question like this. The Jaguar Panthera Onca is the largest big cat in the Americas and the third largest in the world after the lion and tiger. Complete the following table to show the classification of the Jaguar. You should be able to fill in the left hand side fairly easily. So we've got kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. We know jaguars are animals, so they will be in the kingdom animalia. How do we know what the genus is? If you have a look at the two part or binomial name in the question and below here, the genus is the first part of the name. So the answer in here is Panthera. And don't forget to write the capital letter for the Panthera. These two animals look very similar to each other. And back in the 1700s, they will have been classified according to observable features, i.e. what they look like and possibly their behaviour as well. And they probably will have been classified in two similar groups. However, they are very different. The animal on the left is a tenrec and can be found in Madagascar. And the hedgehog on the right can be found in Europe. Looking at their up-to-date classifications, both animals are in the kingdom Animalia. They are both in the phylum Chordata. That means they have a backbone. And they are both mammals. But that is as far as the similarities go. You can see that they belong to completely different families and therefore are different species from one another. Check out their binomial names. The genus first, 
than the species, a capital letter for the genus part of the name. It is easier to classify organisms now compared to the 1700s because technology has moved on. We have more evidence, we have more data, we know about DNA, RNA, and we know about evolutionary relationships. So classification is much more thorough now. In the 1990s, a new classification idea was taken on board by scientists thanks to Carl Woese, a famous microbiologist. He researched into the genes that code for ribosomes in prokaryotic cells and he noticed some fundamental differences between organisms that had been grouped in the kingdom prokaryote. The differences were such that he divided the kingdom into archaea and bacteria. These are still prokaryotic, but another taxonomic level was needed, and that taxonomic level is called a domain. As well as the archaea and the bacteria, there's a third domain called eukaryota. So obviously organisms with eukaryotic cells belong to this domain. And the archaea bacteria eukaryota is what's known as the three domain system. And even though Woese discovered this in the 1970s, his theory was not accepted until the 1990s. Now these domains have been added to the already existing Linnaean system. A very interesting discovery is that the archaea are actually more closely related to the eukaryota than they are bacteria. Modern classification also looks at evolutionary relationships between organisms. This is an example of an evolutionary tree, also known as a phylogenetic tree. See the timeline across the bottom? We can see that species A and B are most closely related and that they share a common ancestor that lived many years ago. C and D share a common ancestor that existed many years ago. And if we go even further back in time, we can see that A, B, C and D share a common ancestor as well. Here is another example of what we may see. On this diagram, humans and chimpanzees are most closely related and we share a common ancestor that existed about six million years ago. A common misconception is that humans have evolved from chimpanzees, but that is not the case. We had a common ancestor around six million years ago, but we took a completely different evolutionary path to get to where we are now. Which monkey is most closely related to the woolly monkey? Have a look, it is the spider monkey. And we know this because those two have a common ancestor. Which species emerged first out of the owl monkey and the squirrel monkey? Look at the ancestors. The owl monkey's evolutionary path started before the squirrel monkeys. As in the owl monkey branches off further back in time compared to the squirrel monkey. Here we can see some more details about human evolution and you can see the timeline and that chimpanzees and humans are still in existence because they line up to the present day. The Homo neanderthalensis, also known as Neanderthal man, doesn't quite line up to the present and that shows you that they are extinct, which of course we already know. Also extinct are all the other species that don't line up to the current time. Here's another question, this time on the northern giraffe. As before, fill in the left-hand side first. So we've got kingdom, phylum class, order, family, genus, species. Use the table to find its binomial name. So it's giraffa camelopardalis. Excuse the pronunciation. And we can add the domain to this too. So we know giraffes have eukaryotic cells, so they will belong to the domain eukaryota. And that is it. If you found this useful, please like and subscribe to keep up to date with more content.